welcome to the first Waterbury Lecture for the 2012-2013 academic year. And for the first time, a Waterbury Lecture in this new fine facility of the Krauss Innovation Studio here in the College of Education. The Waterbury Chair has held this lecture series. This is the fourth year now. And we take two focuses on the um, agenda. One of them is STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And another one is science studies and science education. Tonight's lecture will bridge both. But there is another agenda, too. Over the next two days, and I'd like to, Michael and Eric, if you'll just wave, and I will be hosting a workshop on teaching controversy and how it relates to the preparation of pre-service teachers. And so I also want to extend an invitation, not an invitation, but a thank you to our guests who accepted our invitation uh, to come and be with us for the next couple of days to our uh, faculty from various universities across the state of Pennsylvania who will help us think about a research project in investigating how we prepare teachers to teach controversies. So welcome to our guests. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Michael Roos. Michael is the uh, Lucille Merkmeister Professor of Philosophy and Zoology at Florida State University. Uh, Michael has taught at the University of Guelph, Canada for 35 years. And in 1986, he was elected to the, be a fellow of both the Royal C Society of Canada and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He was an expert witness for the plaintiff in the 1981 McLean versus Arkansas trial, testing the state law permitting the teaching of creation science in the Arkansas school system. Quote, public schools within this state shall give balanced treatment to creation science and to evolution science. The federal judge ruled that state law was unconstitutional, and Michael certainly had a hand in helping the judge make his decision. Since then, Michael has sustained a high profile as a scholar examining many issues about the, the, the schooling debate that continues even to this day. The most recent high profile creation science legal case based on intelligent design arguments took place right here in Pennsylvania, in Dover, Pennsylvania within the last decade. Uh, Michael takes the position that it is possible to reconcile Christian religion and evolutionary theory, and we'll hear more about that today. Um, he is a prolific scholar, uh, 30 scholarly books in philosophy of biology, many titles that deal with the topic that he'll be talking with tonight, but you are now in the midst of what I would think is your magnum opus, <laughs> is the Encyclopedia <laughs> of Darwin, is that what That's it is? That's right. Yeah, the Encyclopedia of Darwin. And, um, and evolution, let's not be modest And about evolution. It. So please join me in welcoming <laughs> Michael tonight. Well, thanks so much. I, I, I'm afraid the thing which really attracts me up here just at the moment is the fall colours. I, having lived in Ontario for, for almost 40 <coughs> years, now down in, in Florida, and we do have a winter. I think it's from December 28th to the 29th, but <laughs> that's about it. And I, the one thing I miss I is the fall colours, and I've just already been looking at them and enjoying them immensely. I, you know, the trouble is, you put me in a college of education, you put me with a board like this, I, I don't want to talk about this, I want to say two things for you, if you want to pass this course. First of all, <laughs> my name is Roos, and it's a short S, if you call me Roos, you're in big trouble. The other thing is, it's it's with an apostrophe <laughs> when it's when it's condensed from it is, but it's not when it's used in the possessive. And I know several of you are going to commit this mistake on the first exam, and I just want you all to know you're in big trouble right now. So just, just get those two clearly in mind. What's going wrong with me? As soon as I, you know, I, being, being a professor for 48 years and having a mother as a school teacher, as soon as I get in a situation like this, it, it happens. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about something uh, this afternoon. Uh, a lot of the material will, in fact, be familiar to a lot of you, but I just want to give you a, d a slightly different perspective, and uh, maybe this is one that you've never heard of before because it's so false that only somebody, a philosopher like me, would think it up. But basically, what I want to argue is that in order to understand the evolution-creation controversy, 
don't look at the theology, folks. Don't look at the theology. Look at the culture. But in order to understand what's going on, I think this is a cultural study, first and foremost. It's not about science. It's not about theology. It's about culture. And what I want to do this afternoon is just give you the sketch of an, I an argument why I think it's this way. So let's start with the two sides. On the one hand, you've got the so-called new atheists. That's uh, Steve Pinker, the linguist at Harvard. That's Jeff Bezos, who's a very rich man because he owns Amazon. Uh, that, of course, is Richard Dawkins. And looking somewhat like a minor prophet, that's Dan Dennett, the philosopher. And they are committed evolutionists in every aspect of the word, of course, and not only committed evolutionists, but truly and, and completely not just atheists, but real God-haters. These people really have a thing about Jehovah. Uh, and uh, as I, s I like to say, actually, it's not bad beer at all. <laughs> every, every, their whole life. Is, is evolutionary in some sense or another. I mean, it, I mean I, 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 even this silly you know, thing shows something that this is not, I mean, you don't have molecules. I've never seen a beer. I've never seen a beer which says H2SO4 to you too. I mean, you don't have beers which talk about you know, the, the, the atom or something, or maybe you do in Pennsylvania, but anyhow. But you do have beers which make jokes or proudly say, we're into evolution, folks. We're modernists, you know, go with this. On the other side, you've got, I, I, I don't quite know what I want to call this. I'll call it the evangelical right, but I do want to say, to, particularly to any evangelicals in the room, I don't mean that all evangelicals belong in this group, because they certainly don't. But certainly, I think as, it's as good a term as any to use. And these are the people like Philip Johnson, the former law professor at, at Berkeley, and Bill Dembski, uh, who is a, a leading uh, a leading uh, exponent of so-called intelligent design theory. And basically, whatever else they want to say, I think you should be more explicit here <laughs> in step two, and then a miracle occurs. These are the people who basically want to argue at some level that you can't do it through science. You've got to bring in God somewhere along the line. Now, of course, they go all the way from the intelligent designers all the way to the what we call the young earth creationists in the trade, the people who believe in six days of creation, uh, who believe in Adam and Eve, and who believe in a, a, a universal flood uh, sometime thereafter, the sort of people who are represented at the Creationism Museum uh, in just south of Cincinnati. And incidentally, <coughs> if ever you get the chance to go there, don't, don't miss it. Don't miss it. It's a wonderful afternoon out. And the puzzle I've got is, why did Mr. and Mrs. Noah need to have curtains in the ark? Uh, you know, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, I think you should be more explicit in, in two. And of course, as you know, uh, to bring in the local thing, uh, in 19, uh, 2005, Dover, Pennsylvania, had the court case where a very conservative judge, a Lutheran, uh, somebody who was in fact uh, appointed by George W. Bush, uh, set out and uh, argued or uh, claimed that they should not be allowed to teach this in the schools, at which point, of course, uh, the Reverend Pat Robertson, who seems to have a hotline to God, <laughs> told us all that God is not pleased. I'd like to say to the good citizens of Dover, if there is a disaster in your area, don't turn to God. You just rejected him from your city. God is tolerant and loving, but we can't keep sticking our finger in his eye forever. If they have future problems in Dover, I recommend they call on Charles Darwin. Maybe he can help them. <laughs> so here we've got then two very, I mean, two very diametrically opposed groups. This is not like, you know, a couple of people, a couple of people who have a difference, let's get together and let's talk the, you know. Is the ontological argument valid or not? I don't think anybody is going to refuse to have a drink with somebody at the end of the evening because they differ on the, you know, on the validity of the ontological argument. But these people feel very strongly about their positions, and they really are very diametrically opposed. What I want to talk about is where, where did this come from? And I'm, I'm an evolutionist, and I think that if you want to understand the present, you've got to understand the past. And so what I want to do is give you some history, but do notice that this is not history for its own sake. It's history to try to understand why we are where we are at the moment. And let's start with the fact that traditional Christianity, traditional Christianity is not literalist 
in the way that today's young earth creationists are. If young earth creationists say, I'm a traditional Christian, you say to them, you may be a Christian, but you're certainly not a traditionalist. This, as I'm going to point out, is early 19th century American Protestantism. It is not traditional Christianity. Probably the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, philosopher, the greatest theologian the church has ever known was St. Augustine. I love this picture of St. Augustine. He's normally portrayed a little bit like me in bedclothes, you know, sort of old and rather decrepit and, you know, that sort of thing. But of course, he was quite a young man, a, g a guy as a young man. He's the guy who said, oh, God, make me good, but not just yet. And this is St. Monica, his mother, who kept nagging him until he finally went to St. Ambrose and said, okay, I'll give it all up and I'll become a, a priest. And then he became a bishop. And St. Augustine, around about 400 AD, said quite explicitly, he said, of course the Bible is true. But he said, we've got to be very careful about reading the Bible. Because as a young man, St. Augustine was a Manichaean. And Manichaeans, uh, amongst other things, did not espouse the Old Testament. There was a lot of debate in, the early, in early Christianity about the Old Testament. The Jews had crucified Jesus. That's what they said. Should we, therefore, as Christians, take seriously the Jewish, the Jewish stories? Or is that their Bible, and now we've got our Bible, and the two are separate? And St. Augustine said, yes, obviously, you've got to take the Old Testament seriously, literally, in some level. Because without the Old Testament, the New Testament does not make sense. Why did God have to come? Why did God have to die on the cross for our sins? The only way we can make sense of this is through the Genesis story. So yes, we have got to incorporate the Old Testament in our sacred books. However, St. Augustine said, we are sophisticated Romans. We know about philosophy. We know about science. Abraham and Isaac and the others may have been people of great spiritual intensity, but they were not philosophers. They were not scientists. They were not men of literacy and these things. And had God spoken to them in terms of science, had God explained to them about the rainbow, and of course already St. Augustine knew what was going on with the rainbow, the refraction and these sorts of things. He said, had God spoken to them, they would have looked at God and said, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so he said they, God had to speak to them in metaphors, uh, uh, you know, speaking of rainbows as bows and, and, and these sorts of things in the sky and that sort of thing. He said, but we don't have to be thus constrained. Sure, the story of Genesis is true. It could not be truer. But if it's necessary to interpret these things metaphorically or allegorically, <coughs> then not only is it possible to do these things, but it is absolutely obligatory on us as creatures made in the image of God to use our God-given reason in order to try to understand his creation. So the point I want to make is that the Christian tradition has always been one that science is not an enemy of Christianity, but that it is, in a way, not, uh, it's a friend, it's a product of Christianity in the higher sense. Now, it doesn't mean to say that the Christian church has always been consistent about this. And, of course, we all know about the Galileo story. But uh, if you look at the Galileo story a little more carefully, as scholars have done, you see that this was... Again, it wasn't a, a theological or even a scientific issue. A lot of this was to do with politics and particularly to do with the fact that the church was in the Counter-Reformation against the Protestants at the time and was very, very insecure and, and issues like that. So I'm not, I don't want to gloss over Galileo, but I do want to say, as any Catholic theologian today would say, the church blew that one, not only socially and politically, but also theologically as well. So the point I'm making is that it isn't always easy, but it has always been the traditional Christian position, and this holds for Protestants too, because don't forget that Luther and Calvin were deeply Augustinian in their theology. It was St. Augustine who was their, their theologian. And so it's always been part of the Christian tradition that, that one's got to find some way of living with science, that it, it, it would be... It would be immoral, it would be her heresy not to do so. So let's come to the time then, let's jump right forward into the 19th century. This is Charles Robert Darwin, who was born on February the 12th, 1809. Who else was born on February the 12th, 1809? Don't, don't, I, I, you, all you old codgers, you all know I know. Who else was born on? Who was born on February the 12th, 1809? I'm not just going to pick on the women. <laughs> Come on, you're a man, aren't you? Come on. You I, I have no idea. You've got no idea. 
We're in the north up here. We're in the north. Down in Florida, it might be excusable. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, you knew, you knew. You, you could, you, you're the kind of girl I hated when I was at school. You always had your hand up before I did. There was a girl called Anne Scriven. And if I get 91, you could guarantee Anne Scriven got 92. You know? I, know the, I know the kind of girl that you are. Always with the answer before me. Just that fraction before. Anyhow, yes, Darwin, was, as it happens, was born on the same day but in England. He, he, as a young man, he went on the, the so-called Voyage of the Beagle. He went for five years going around the world, and he ended up at the Galapagos Archipelago, which is a group of islands uh, off uh, South America. They belong to Ecuador now. And while he was there, he discovered, or it was pointed out to him, that the tortoises on the different islands are similar but different. And he also collected the birds. And when he got home and an ornithologist said, yes, these birds are different species from the different islands, Darwin said there's only one explanation. It must be evolution. And so Darwin became an evolutionist in 1837. And this, in fact, is the first Darwinian tree of life that we've got drawn from one of his notebooks. He sat on his ideas for 20 years and finally published on the origin of species by means of natural selection in 1859. This was his uh, great work on evolution where he argued not only that we all are descended from one or a few forms, as he said, but that the process is something brought on by the struggle for existence. This leads to a natural selecting, and over time you get new organisms, new forms. Now, the question is, what sort of Oh, available. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, uh, do we, I think we want to update later. Don't we? Do, can I do this? Okay, you're you're dealing with a philosopher here. Am I supposed to do something with it later, I think? Now, what do I do? Do I press enter? Oh, that doesn't seem to work, does it? There we are. Oh, okay. So Darwin publishes The Origin of Species in 1859. Now, we know that there was indeed some church opposition with the Bishop of Oxford opposing um, Thomas Henry Huxley and that sort of thing. But what was the general overall position of the church on this? Well, actually, as scholars have found, very, very, very quickly, the church, church people accepted evolution. It's amazing how quick. Now, you might say, how do you know that? because people have gone back and looked at sort of parish quarterlies and that sort of thing, or the church times and that sort of thing. And within, let us say, even five years, what you find is that evolutionary ideas are being introduced, and then suddenly it's switched and people are saying, well, of course evolution's true. Let's, you know, what does this mean for us? Or how do we understand this sort of thing? And this was certainly the case in England. It was certainly the case, particularly in Germany. Uh, the French were in a bit of a sulk. They still are because Darwin wasn't a Frenchman. But uh, I'm not joking about that. And also in the north, as I'm going to point out, in, 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 the, in, in the north of the United States of America. So very quickly, evolution was accepted in some form or another. A lot of people debated about natural selection, but the scientists were debating about this. A good example would be John Henry Newman, the great uh, Catholic theologian, English theologian, who started as an Anglican but ended his life as a cardinal in the, in the Catholic Church. And Newman, was all, although he was not a scientist, was always interested in science. And in 1870, I think it is, Newman was asked uh, by uh, an old Protestant friend about whether Oxford should offer an honorary degree to Darwin. And Newman wrote, and this is a letter that he wrote, is this, Darwin's theory, against the distinct teaching of the inspired text? If it is, then he advocates an anti-Christian theory. For myself, speaking under correction, I don't see that it does contradict it. Newman was quite open, quite blunt about this. He said, you know, in fact, elsewhere he said, you know, my God, in a sense, that, you know, why worry about evolution? My God is the God of love, the God of mercy, the God who died on the cross for my sins. What the hell has evolution got to do? He never used that word. <laughs> but what the hell has evolution got to do with any of that? Whether we're modified monkeys or modified mud, it just doesn't make any difference. The, what, what is crucial for me is that I am one of God's creatures fallen, and God so loved me, he died on the cross for my sins. That's 
Christianity for me, and evolution doesn't have a, you know, it's not that evolution is right or wrong, evolution just ain't relevant to this sort of thing, folks. So the, 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 the big question then I want to ask this, this evening is why then have we got this clash today? Why have we got this clash today? Why, if this is the Christian tradition, why then is it that we've got the new atheists on the one side and the, the, the fundamentalist evangelical right or whatever you want to call them on the other side? And why do we have this particular clash? And of course, why do we have it in America? Well, I want to go back now, having taken you up to 1859, 1870, I'd like to slip back now to around about 1700, to the time of the so-called Enlightenment. When, if you ask any student of the Christian religion, you say, what is the most important event? Well, you know, there are, is it, was it the split with the East around about 1,000? Was it, I mean, obviously the Protestant Reformation <laughs> in the early 16th century is going to have pride of place, obviously. But a lot of historians would say <laughs> any account of Christianity which does not take the Enlightenment into account and put it up front is dreadfully distorted because neither Luther nor Calvin nor Swingley or any of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation wanted to deny Christianity. They just wanted to do it better. But by about 1700, thanks to a number of factors, one was science, obviously, another was philosophy. Think of, although Descartes was always a sincere Catholic, he had his me method of systematic doubt, introducing this evil demon who might make everything phony or something like that was deeply corrosive. Uh, all of these sorts of factors started to make people think, you know, maybe there's something going on here. And particularly, particularly the encounter with the East, as the Portuguese and English and other traders went around Africa to India and on to China, they found these highly sophisticated societies with highly sophisticated religions. <coughs> and Jesus Christ didn't focus, feature in them at all. And, you know, they said, what the hell is going on? The English were particularly caught on this because the English hated missionaries and the Christian missionaries. And until the 19th century, they wouldn't let them into India, for instance, because they knew as soon as missionaries get in, they start converting people and you're got, gonna have religious troubles. So the English did everything they could to keep missionaries out of, out of India. And of course, part of their argument was, what right have we got to go in and tell these sophisticated thinkers you know, how they should believe? Well, you, you say that long enough and people are gonna start taking you seriously. So the point I'm making is by the beginning of the 18th century, what you find is that you've got, you've got people actually having to wrestle with the possibility that it might not be true. Now, it is not to say that immediately everybody became Richard Dawkins atheists, because they didn't. But there were two basic responses, faith or reason. And what people did was, on the one hand, there were those who said, we've gone far enough, stop, pull back, let's have the religion of the heart. Let's have the religion of providence. It wasn't so much a question of biblical literalism. It was more a question of theology, that we are nothing without God's redeeming grace. We can do nothing on our own. The, the great hymn by Isaac Watts, which I think is 1709, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my greatest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. You see the theology which is going on there. I am nothing without the blood of the Redeemer. And this is why you get people like the pietists in Germany and others starting to come in at this point. On the other hand, what you had was those who said, we've gone this far, let's push it. Let's go all the way with science, with reason, with progress, that we can do it on our own. We can, excuse me, we can improve things through our own effort. Many of them were even, the theists are people who believe in an intervening God. Deists are people who believe in a God as unmoved mover, who set everything in motion and doesn't interfere now. Now most of these people became deists of one sort or another, although they were certainly theists who said, God helps those who help themselves. And a, a great deal about the, the parable of the talents, that was a big one, that we're not put on this earth just to sit on our bums and you know wait for salvation, that God has given us our gifts and this is what we're supposed to be doing here on earth. But what you got was these two 
opposing sorts of views. And evolution gets caught up in this because evolution gets identified with progress. So evolution from the beginning, and it begins in the 18th century, is never a theory-neutral idea. It's always one which is caught, but it's not caught in Genesis. I want to point out, Genesis comes later. It's providence versus progress, which is the big thing. Now, who would be good representatives? Well, on the one hand, you'd have somebody like John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. John Wesley was a, a very educated man. He'd been at Oxford. But what happened? One Easter, he said, I felt my heart curiously warmed. Not my head. You know, not that I had a flash of inspiration or something like that. I felt my heart curiously warmed. And, of course, the Methodists appealed to the people, to the uneducated, I mean, if I put it this way, the less educated, the working class. Methodism has always, certainly in England, has always been much more a lower class, I mean, in, in that sense, sort of religion, as opposed to the Anglican Church of England, Episcopalian, which has always been much more of an upper class sort of religion. I mean, it, it, that's the division that you get there. On the other hand, who would be a good representative of the Enlightenment? Well, Benjamin Franklin would be a perfect example. Benjamin Franklin, who was certainly a deist, he didn't, I mean, if the thing is, none of the, um, the great founders of this country, almost none of them, were, were conventional theists. I mean, you take Washington. Washington was an Episcopalian who would go to church on Sundays. But then his minister said, but General Washington, you never take communion. Don't you think you're setting a bad example? And of course he didn't take communion because he didn't think that Jesus was the Son of God. I mean, he, was, didn't believe, he did not believe in God. He didn't think that Jesus was just an ordinary bloke. He thought Jesus was a great spiritual leader, but he didn't think, he was, he didn't think that he was God. And to take communion would be sacrilege. And Washington, as, as was his wont, thought about it quietly and said, Minister, you're absolutely right. So on communion Sundays, Washington would stay home after that. So, yeah. so the point, uh, again, this is, this is the Enlightenment. And this gets caught up with evolution. Evolution is, is the idea of progress, progress in the social world, progress in the, in, in the organic world. I'm not sure that Franklin was a, an evolutionist, but his very close friend, Erasmus Darwin, who was Darwin's grandfather, was, for instance, an example of this. And the thing is, what you've got then is evolution's caught up because you've got rival stories about origins. You see, this is what the point I want to make. Evolution isn't something which is irrelevant to Christianity. Evolution, if you like, in a way, is a bastard child of Christianity because evolution is speaking to the same problem. The ancient Greeks didn't, by and large, with some exception, didn't raise issues about origins. For Aristotle, the world is eternal. It, it, you know, it's rather like asking, when did the circle, you know, when did you know, the circle first have a, 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 you know, the connection to pi r or something? When did that first happen? Well, it's, it's, what a silly question. It's, a, it's not just, it, it, it's a question like saying, why is Tuesday so tired? It's, you know, it's what we philosophers call a category mistake. And for somebody like Aristotle, questions about origins just were category mistakes. The world is eternal, just like mathematics is eternal. And that's, where you, that's where you go. That's, that's where you start. And we're all, you know, the, the, the un, unmoved mover for Aristotle is something that always has been and always will be. And so, and of course, Plato, particularly in the Republic, is wrestling with the point that the world is eternal. And yet, somehow, we're not. How do, you, how do you wrestle with these issues? Now, the point about Christianity, which, of course, incorporates what Thomas Carlyle called Jewish old clothes. Once you've got the stories of, of the Old Testament, you've got a creation story, you've got a history, and one which makes humans super important. Because we, uniquely, are made in the image of God. It, it ain't for the sparrows or the warthogs that Jesus died on the cross. It's for us. So you've got this story of origins which makes us so central. And the thing about evolution, particularly as it was interpreted back then, it too is a story of origins. And by God, it's a story which made humans absolutely central. That you know, it, 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 It's all about us, folks. <laughs> and don't, you know, don't kid yourself. So... The point I'm making already, you see, you've got the makings for a cultural clash because these people are not talking sort of like that. 
They're talking like that. Now, what happens in the story of evolution after Darwin? Well, of course, his great supporter was Thomas Henry Huxley, his so-called bulldog. The, that's the grandfather of Aldous Huxley, the novelist. And he, you can see, I love this picture of Huxley because he was a great educator. And this is pre-PowerPoint days when you, if you, you really need to have a skill as a blackboard artist. I'm old enough to remember some of my teachers were terrific teachers because they could come in and they could draw the Holy Land as they were talking to us in multiple shorts and then turn around and say, and here is where Elijah, you know, suddenly we've got this wonderful map which lasted for 50 minutes and then it would be rubbed out and you go on and you see Huxley was equally good at this sort of thing. Now, Huxley was much involved in secondary or uh, rather tertiary education. And he knew that in order to start a program, let's say a program in science ed, what you've got to do, and I can see the chair or the dean at the back nodding her head already, what's the big issue? Who's going to pay? Who is going to pay? Rick comes in to the chair and says, I've got this wonderful idea. I think we should do existential science ed, and we should start a graduate program, and we should have 50 postdocs, and we, let's say 100 graduate students, and we'll need a building and everything like that. And the chair or the dean is going to say to him, as they always do, they're going to say, this sounds like a really good idea, Rick. That's what they always say when they're about to turn you down. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're going to say, but Rick, who's going to pay for this? Oh, well, that's easy. I mean, that's your problem. You're the chair. You know, you were <laughs> well, by the time Rick's got back to his office, the chair's on the phone to the dean saying, is this guy's tenure absolutely secure? Or is there some way we can get rid of the son of a bitch? <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, who's going to pay? Huxley knew this. He wanted biological education. There were two groups that he could go for, the teachers and the doctors. The teachers, public education was now just coming into England and fully, uh, in, uh, fully paid uh, 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 school education. And doctors, after the Crimean War, and, uh, where more people died of diseases than died of, of, of injuries, the doctors were starting to realize they've got to start curing people rather than killing them. And Huxley said, I can help. He said, uh, and also, they were having all sorts of social problems in these big cities. This is the so-called big stink in in uh, 1858, when the River Thames, which goes past the House of Commons, literally became one wall-to-wall -wall turd. I mean, no kidding. It was absolutely awful because everybody was, you know, making poo and then they were emptying it into the Thames. They realized they'd got to have proper sewers and all of these sorts of things. And they did. I mean, to the great, great credit of the Victorians, they did do these things and they did set about these things. But it meant that they had to have science, technology, all of these things, that Latin and learning Latin and Greek and theology wasn't going to work. You had to have STEM, if you like, I, that, the, the trendy word that we all use these days. So what was professional science for Huxley? Physiology, doctors need physiology. Embryology, you can't, you know, you, doctors need embryology so they can see things about the developing organism, these sort of things. Anatomy, uh, morphology, something he told, sold to the school teachers. He said, get the kids in there, you know, with rabbits and frogs and that sort of thing, working on that rather than doing Latin, because it's good training for the kind of lives that they, even though they may be, a, a, you know, engi civil engineers later in life, they've learned to think with their hands, they've learned to look at nature, they've learned to study, and all of these things. Now, where did evolution fit into this? It didn't, because evolution didn't, as far as Huxley could see, cure a pain in the belly. It was clearly controversial, so it was going to be difficult at the school level. However, it was a perfect sort of overall ideology. It was the perfect sort of flag in which one could push this if I say materialistic, I don't mean hardline atheistic. I mean, actually, was an agnostic, actually. But what I mean is that technological STEM sort of approach to, to, the, to the world, that what we've got to do is we've got to have technology or social engineering. We need, already they were starting to say, we need sociologists or anthropologists or psychologists. Eco economists, political economists were very important. You've got to have that kind of training rather than Latin and Greek, and I regret to say philosophy. So evolution then became the kind of background belief, and it was caught up in this. Uh, Her Darwin wasn't very good at this, but Herbert Spencer, uh, an the English philosopher come polymath, was very good. 
and he wrote the books that everybody read, all about progress, all about always leading up to never, it, it never leads up to warthogs, it always le leads up from the monad, from the bottom thing, all the way up through the gorillas up to humans. I mean, this was the picture that they all had. Of course, they fit in all sorts of wonderful Victorian prejudices about this. I mean, for instance, where, for instance, um, who comes down at the bottom of the human thing? And most people said, well, of course, you've got the English up here, and then you've got the Scots, and then maybe the French, and the Americans, dreadful table manners the, the Americans have. <laughs> and then it gets darker and duskier, and you go all the way down to the Terra del Fuegans, right at the bottom. Those are the people at the bottom of South America. And then they said, no, do the Irish come just above or just <laughs> below? <laughs> I kid you not, from 1859 on, you look at the cartoons of Irishmen in magazines like Punch and Puck. They are always presented as Neanderthal. They are always presented. It, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, although it, it joking at one level, the point I'm making is that evolution was molded to fit in to the sorts of prejudices that they got. Nobody, for instance, would have dreamed that Asians would come up here. They would always come down here. Now, this is drawn by Ernst Haeckel who, in fact, had read Rousseau, so was big on American Indians, you know, what we used to call Red Indians, but we don't call them that anymore, except down in Florida where we, you know, the Seminoles still do their thing. But, so you'd have, you'd have the Europeans up here, and then for Heckel, you'd have American Indians here and Asians there. And then he had a couple of Japanese graduate students who impressed the hell out of him. So silently, in the next edition, it was Europeans up here, and then Japanese here, and then American Indians. So you could, you know, you could mold it according to your prejudices. But notice it's a story of origins, and it's a story where humans have pride of place. This is my favorite. This is my favorite. At this time, they were starting to build natural history museums. This is the Natural History Museum in South Kensington on Cromwell Road in, 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 in London. It, and it was built in the 1860s. And they self-consciously modeled them on medieval cathedrals. This is the Cathedral Lau in, in France. They self-consciously modeled them. So instead of going to the Church of Jesus on Sunday morning, on Sunday afternoon, the family would all trot off to the Church of Darwin and look at, of course, by this time, the, the dinosaurs are coming in. And so everybody's, everybody, thanks to Andrew Carnegie, is getting their own models of dinosaurs. So you go there on Sunday afternoon. But notice what museums do. They give you all sorts of instruction about health, about the way to behave, and all of these sorts of things. But always the panorama of evolution was from the blobs up through the dinos and everything. And what comes last? Padam, 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 homo sapiens, Euro europeanensis. I mean, and so this was the picture that was being given all the time. Now what about America? America in the North absorbed all of this after the, after the Civil War. This is Johns Hopkins, founded on industrial money, railway money, in, in 1876, the first German-type university with PhDs in the sciences. 1880 is their first, first commencement. Who is the commencement speaker? Thomas Henry Huxley. And who is he commemorating? His own student who's become professor of anatomy at Johns Hopkins. So they're all absorbing exactly this kind of message. Evolution, progress, modernism, looking forward, all of these sorts of things. Humans at the top, this is our origin story. And of course, if you, this is John Thomas Scopes in 1925 being, being sentenced for teaching evolution. But if you look at the story, it's not about theology. It's about the people in Tennessee loathing all these books from the north about evolution coming down and polluting the minds of their children. And that's what's going on. And to this day, I would argue that you've got this kind of ideology. Perhaps the most famous evolutionist alive today is Edward O. Wilson, who's retired from Harvard. He's the great ant biologist and author of sociobiology. Wilson is not only an explicit evolutionist, is not only an explicit non-believer, but he has all of these views, neo-Spencerian views, about evolution as progressive and that humans came top. And that gives us... Notice what, what religion does. It gives us moral directives. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. 
and things like that. You know, don't sleep with people of your own sex, etc., uh, etc., et and like guns and capital punishment, and all of these sorts of things. Uh, uh, that's intended to be a little bit of a joke, okay? But <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure it's one that one really wants to laugh at. <laughs> but Wilson is worried that we're destroying the planet, and he's worried that we're destroying the planet, and that what's going to happen is that the human life will collapse, and that there will be nothing, absolutely nothing left after we've, after we've destroyed the Brazilian rainforest. So for Wilson, he's saying, get into biodiversity, get into conservation, not because you like just because you like walking in the woods, but because it's absolutely essential to promote this for the well-being of human beings who have risen to the top, and now it's our duty to preserve our status and our position up there. So what I'm saying then is I want to argue that I don't, I'm not saying that anybody who teaches evolution is teaching religion, because I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is that evolution has been used in a social way in a social way, as an overall doctrine of humanism, of, of something like that, to promote a particular viewpoint. Uh, not one. Uh, please understand, I'm not saying it's a bad viewpoint. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying, though, is it is a viewpoint, and it is used in this sort of way. And that the God delusion is not a work on evolutionary biology. It's a polemic promoting a particular philosophy. And that's what I, that's what I want to say. Now... Uh, and what I find fascinating is the kind of issues that evolutionists want to push. Probably many of you know of Jerry Coyne's book. He's a, 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 a Chicago biologist who wrote a very, I think, a very good book on evolutionary theory two or three years ago, Why Evolution is True. And now he runs a blog that he contributes to very much. And you look at the kind of moral directives and the moral concerns that Jerry Coyne has got. I'm taking this from his blog. Increasingly, society is recognizing there is nothing immoral in same-sex marriage, and the trend towards accepting that is simply going to continue. So notice how his... Uh, why, I mean, this is a blog on why evolution is true, but he thinks it's entirely appropriate to have comments like this in that blog. He is not talking about the Hardy-Weinberg law. He's talking social policy. Republican state legislators whose activities would be funny if they weren't so dreadful, especially with regards to women's reproductive freedom. I mean, of course, this is obviously the abortion debate, and I could go on. So what I'm saying is, I mean, look at it. Why evolution is true, but he thinks it's entirely appropriate to include those kinds of moral directives or exhortations in, in what he's doing. Now, let's go to the other side. Let's go to the other side. As I've already said, the American, American Revolution was started by people who were deists, who were progressivists, who were people of science, all of these sorts of things. But it became very quickly, very clear, very quickly, that that kind of philosophy is not a philosophy for starting a young state on its own, particularly a state where you're, where you're going to face all sorts of deprivations, loneliness, and think of the distances they had, and as the state moves west, drought. I mean, read... Read the little books on the prairie books. Read that series. Not, not the saccharine TV program they made of it, but read the original stories, and you get this incredible feeling of, of uh, how difficult it was as one moved west to, 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 to wrest a living from this, this, this country. I mean, it, it was tremendously hard work. I mean, the reason I know all about them is I was in France and the only, only books we could find in the English library there were the Little House on the Prairies series. So I read, uh, there's about 10 of them, I read all of them to my children. They, I, I didn't realize what wonderful stories they were, so it was a wonderful experience. But the thing is, as the country started to grow up, it needed an ideology which was going to have a lot more spunk, a lot more guts than deism. And of course, it was at this point that the evangelicals, the preachers, the Protestants, don't forget, the, Mer the Catholics didn't start to flood into America until mid-century or later. This was a Protestant country, this, and very few Jews. So this was a Protestant country. So you get what is known as the Second Great Awakening, people like Charles Grandison Finney. And they said to the people, particularly out of the big, sophisticated cities in the north, the people in the south and the people as they moved west, I guess I'd better go that way, haven't I, to show you, uh, uh, the people like that, they said, people said, well, what should we do? How do we do it? And they said, the good book 
will help you. Of course, this is just the time when mass printing is coming into effect. So Bibles are no longer things which are going to cost you, you know, two months' income. Bibles now can be produced so cheaply that anybody can and must have a Bible. Everybody must have that basic level of literacy so you can read the Bible. And what they said is, go to the Bible, and St. Paul said, you know, God pr prefers the, uh, the people who are basically uneducated to all those sophisticated ph philosophical types. And so you went to the Bible, what, how should a husband treat his wife? How sh what is the position of a wife in a, in a family? How should children relate to their parents? How should a, a, a master relate to his servants or her servants? And the preachers said, go to the Bible and this will help you and this will give you the answers. It also got caught very much up in the slavery issue because although people from the North were saying, you know, the Christian position is to be against slavery, everybody in the South pointed out that the Bible read literally is, you know, is pretty much pro-slavery. I mean, you know, when, when people like Abraham, uh, you know, committed to, uh, to, to Je Jehovah, they didn't at once free all their serfs or their slaves. Basically, <laughs> what they did was cut the foreskins off the males and <laughs> kept them in slavery. And when the slave went to St. Paul, St. Paul didn't say, oh, let's get rid of slavery. St. Paul said, return to your master and obey him. St. Paul also said to the master, you know, treat your slaves properly. But the point of whatever the historical context is, you can read the Bible as very much pro-slavery, and people did. Now, what happens after the Civil War, which, of course, is the defining event in this country, what, what happens after this is the North, now Johns Hopkins, science, science, pro, you know, liberal Christianity, uh, railways, big industry, Andrew Carnegie. In the South, of course, which is, the, the, which is lost, does the South give up Christianity? Oh, no. It reverts more and more, though, into this kind of evangelical literalism. And sermon after sermon after sermon is preached on the Israelites in captivity, and the people in the South are likened to the Israelites in captivity. God afflicts those most whom he loves most. And this was the kind of... I mean, and again, I'm not making this up. You can go... That we, we, there are huge records on all of this stuff. So this is you know, basic you know, church history. This is very solid church history. So this is what's happening. And the point is that evolution very quickly gets caught up in this debate. I mean, it's, not, it's already in the debate. But Dwight Moody, the great evangelical, the Billy Graham of the second half of the 19th century. Dwight Moody preaches on the four great dangers of the age. Ignoring the Sabbath, Sunday newspapers, the theater, and evolution, including atheism. So evolution, on the other side, is taken as the great Satan. So evolution, as I say, becomes the kind of flag, as it were, it's, you know, it's the mascot. It's the Nittany lion. You know, this is ours, and, you know, the others want to pinch it. Or, you know, nothing would give, you know, your rivals more pleasure than to come in in the middle of the night and paint it, you know, bright red or lemon or pink or, or something like that and say, ha, ha, look at what we've done to your symbol. And, of course, the lion as such is just a symbol, folks. I know, God, what have I said? I'm going to be struck down. But <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, folks, it is just a symbol. <laughs> but, of course, it's a very powerful symbol. And I, what I want to say is evolution has exactly that kind of relationship. We go right up. Let me jump right up. And, and what you see is, again, it, it's evangelical Christianity, but it's caught up in the culture of the age. This is the great Young Earth Creationist book, which is published in 1961. Genesis Flood. Ask yourselves, why were the fundamentalists, are the fundamentalists so worried about the flood? Why the flood rather than the fall? Why write on the flood rather than the Genesis 4? Because they're all dispensationalists. They believe in these periods when God's going to wipe things out. And the end of the first dispensation is, is the flood. And the last one is going to be Armageddon. What was the big worry in 1961? The atomic bomb. The atomic bomb. Everybody going around absolutely terrified that we're going to be wiped out. And so get ready. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Don't get into these stories about progress and improving. What you have got to do, and this is what Billy Graham was telling one after another, is you know, when Billy Graham got up, he didn't say, 
spend a lot of time talking about, you know, let's improve our colleges of education and we've got to improve literacy. No, what Billy Graham did is he got up and said, you know, you are a sinner, you are unhappy, I can offer you the way to salvation. Accept the Lord, come forward, come forward. That's what, that's what he's doing. Premillennial as opposed to, to postmillennial in, in a theological term. So what I'm saying is that the, the, the fundamentalist, the evangelical right side, has always been as much about social issues as about theological issues. And I would want to argue that this is exactly where we, we are today. And here's another Pennsylvania component, because, of course, this is Michael J. Behi at uh, Lehigh University. If you go to the, the chemistry webpage, they have a big notice saying, Michael Behi is one of our colleagues. We respect his right to believe what he does, but none of us think that we all think he's absolutely stark raving bonkers, <laughs> which is quite an interesting <laughs> opening website to have <laughs> for a department. Um, but if you look at Michael B. Hay, of course, he's arguing for this miracle sort of position, and so also is Philip Johnson in his little book, Darwin on Trial. But what is so fascinating is that when you look at these books, these people, by and large, are not worried about gaps in the fossil record. These are more sophisticated. By and large, these people aren't altogether worried about 6,000 years of creation. They're not worrying about a lot of that. When they put in these arguments, but it's only about the first third of their books. If you look at their books, they get this stuff, and then, at least for the last half, if not more, they say, right, now we put the boot into evolution. Now, let us tell you about our agenda. And our agenda is never a theological agenda. It's always a social agenda. It's always a cultural agenda. And if you look at works like Darwin on Trial and some of uh, certainly Dembski's more recent writings, and if you look at Behe's more recent writings, what you see is they're now quite openly pushing the social cultural agenda. What does the Bible say about abortion? These are the sorts of issues that somebody like Johnson is talking about. What does the Bible have to say about homosexuality and gay marriage? And we all know exactly where they stand on these things. What does the Bible say about capital punishment? This is, in fact, the, uh, the people who killed Lincoln or the conspirators against Lincoln uh, being hanged. Um, so these are the sorts of issues that they're dealing with. And the point I'm making is notice how they are mirroring, completely echoing, the particular things that somebody like Jerry Coyne picks out on why evolution is true. These are pe not people talking like this. These are people talking like this. And my particular favorite is cross-dressing. Now, if you read Philip Johnson's works, he, he keeps going on and on and on about cross-dressing. And I couldn't understand why this was happening. I thought, to the best of my knowledge, you know, Richard Dawkins does not go home and put on a bra and panties. I mean, you know, and, and I began to wonder about Philip Johnson. I wondered whether he, he'd got issues, you know. I mean, does he go home and ask his wife, you know, is, is my silky pink nighty back from the cleaners yet, dear? I mean, why was he going on about cross-dressing? And then a woman in, in an audience of a talk like this I was giving said, it's got nothing to do with cross-dressing like this. It's got everything to do with stroppy broads in pantsuits. That's what he's against. He's against strong women who are breaking with feminist ideal, uh, feminists who are breaking with the idea of the angel in the house, that a woman's position is in the home with the children rather than out ch challenging men. And so these are the sorts of issues which are being dealt with. And that's the point I want to end with, that this is not a theological clash. This is not, I don't think it's a scientific clash, but I think it's a cultural clash and I think that there are very good reasons for this. I don't think cultural clashes come about just by chance. And I think there's a particular reason, given America's history, independence, the Civil War, and many of these sorts of issues, why in so many respects this is a distinctively, uh, a distinctively uh, American clash, although it certainly is not something unknown in England. You know, there was this bus... <laughs> The, the Christian said, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live. And so Richard Dawkins and company bought their posters, which says, there's probably no God, so stop worrying and enjoy your life. 
They weren't allowed to say there is no God because that ran into truth in advertising problems. <laughs> so it, it's not just an American problem, but it is so very essentially American problem. And that is the point at which I want to leave you. <laughs> now, Rick, do you want me to take the plane out right now? Uh, <laughs> Yes, you could, but we won't let you. You've got to help us out tomorrow. So, um, well, that was stimulating. He, he continues to be the, the great orator. <laughs> we have some time for some questions, if people, or comments that people might want to make. If you're a tough act to follow. Yeah. Uh, hold on a second, my colleague. I'm going to let you speak because we're recording this. I come from uh, socialist education, history education is my uh, specialty, so I really enjoyed the historicization of this scientific and cultural dispute. Uh, one thing that I was curious about that you didn't mention when talking about the Enlightenment, I was curious if you had any thoughts, is um, the effect that some of the more radical expressions, the more militant radical expressions of the Enlightenment may have had on stimulating fear about uh, society going out of control. So specifically, I'm thinking of the French Revolution. Yeah, and uh, both the French Revolution and also Tom Paine. Don't let's yes. not forget Tom Paine. Yeah, oh, th you're absolutely right. I mean, the French Revolution, I mean, to use a, a technical philosophical term, the French Revolution scared the shit out of a lot of people. I mean, it, it absolutely terrified people. And but uh, this is one of the reasons, for instance, nobody objected to Erasmus Darwin pushing evolution until about the second or third year of the French Revolution. I mean, don't forget, an awful lot of English intellectuals and others were very strongly in favor of the American Revolution. You must understand that there was not universal opposition to uh, the Americans break. I mean, th these were Englishmen. I mean, don't forget, I mean, and people knew people like Franklin uh, uh, intimately as, as close friends, and they empathized deeply. A lot of the English people empathized deeply with the American Revolution. So that was never an issue in the, in, at that level. I mean, there were others who didn't, but, I mean, but when it came to the French Revolution, you're right. For the first year or two, people like Erasmus Darwin said, thank God this is happening. You know, that it was clear that France was, you know, the ancient regime was in fact corrupt and it was holding back. Uh, they were not industrializing as England was. And a lot of people celebrated, but of course, within two years, they were chopping everybody's head off. And at this point, you know, the conservatives like Burke and, and Canning and others came in in a very big way. And one of the things they did was to criticize views of progress. People like, I mean, Malthus, of course, is writing against Condorcet, for instance. And so you're absolutely right. And then, of course, what with the Napoleonic Wars as well. So there were, there were many, many issues which got caught up in this. And uh, you're right, I think, to talk about America and people like Tom Paine, you know, a lot of people felt, you know, this guy is just out of control. And this is, you know, this is worrying. We, you know, we're a new nation, we're a new society, we've got a lot of difficult issues to deal with. We don't want those French or those radical ideas coming in and messing everything up. So it, it's fascinating. My colleague Amanda Porterfield has just written a very interesting book on this very issue. Why was it? that a country that was founded by Enlightenment figures, and despite what the Tea Party people say, the, the founders were deists. They really were. They truly, really, truly were. They were men of reason of the Enlightenment. But why was it within 30, 40 years, <laughs> you know, the Great Awakening has put its stamp on so much of America? So you're, you're completely right to bring in things like the, Amer the, the French Revolution, but you know, anybody who's gonna tell a tale is, uh, the worst, uh, you know, the worst teachers you can have are the teachers who cannot simplify and falsify. That I had a colleague, I had a colleague who would teach introductory philosophy, and on the second day, he would get into the paradoxes of confirmation, and on week 12, he was still in them. You know, that's not the way you teach. <laughs> Boy, I'm in a condescending state, you know, <laughs> telling you all, how, are you still awake? It was a bit tough for a while there, wasn't it, when I got <laughs> to Augusta. I noticed that Augustine was almost like a flag for you. As soon as I said Augustine, <laughs> <laughs> But when I got back to the Protestants, you looked up and said, ah, oh, yeah, these are my people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have another question here? Yes. Uh, Professor, Professor Roos, um, I recently worked through um, 
a book by Stephen Meyer. It's, a, it's an intelligent design book. I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with the fellow. I'm, you're probably very familiar with the book, I know Steve, Signature yeah. in the Cell. Um, and I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity since I read the book. Uh, he has a f uh, picture of you and some, uh, some comments in there pertaining to you about um, the basis, as you well know, um, is that uh, I guess the thesis of the book is that infusion of complex information was required in order to generate, let's say, the first living cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to ask you, he of course describes that to an intelligent designer. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take this opportunity to ask you what the prospects would be from a purely, purely materialistic standpoint mm -hmm for the source, that source of information? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Can I answer it almost in three parts? First of all, of course, this afternoon, and I, this is not trying to run away from it because I'll, I'll address it. This afternoon, I was not so much talking about the truths of the positions, but trying to talk about these, p these are positions to which people are deeply committed. And my problem this afternoon was not, is evolution true? But my problem this afternoon is, why do we have this particular clash in the light of the Christian tradition? So, that, so that's true. Secondly, uh, yes, obviously I think that Steve is wrong when he wants to argue that uh, we can't get it through natural selection or something like that. I would say that I'm not convinced that... It, I, 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 I would differ, say, from Dan Dennett on some of these issues. Uh, I, I personally, I'm not sure we're ever going to solve the body-mind problem. I mean, I'm one of those people, they call the new mysterians, who honestly think that at some level, solving the body-mind problem is almost like solving the problem of why is there something rather than nothing. That these, at some level, are problems, metaphysical, I mean, because a lot of people would say, therefore, they're not real problems. I think they are. But I, w so I'm not sure that we're ever going to solve the issue, ultimate issue of consciousness. I mean, I think we can do a lot of cognitive science, brain science. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about why does a computer made out of meat think? <laughs> so I'm not convinced that all problems can be solved. I, having said that, I don't, uh, my personal conviction is that the origin of life issue is not one of those problems. I don't think it's been solved at the moment. But if you look at some of the work which is being done, I mean, for instance, I had an essay in a collection I, I edited, Evolution, the First Four Billion Years, on, you know, on getting RNA to work spontaneously and these sort of issues. They're not there yet. They may not be there for another hundred years, although, who knows, they may be there in a week. But my personal feeling is that an awful lot of fruitful work is going on on trying to show how self-replicating molecules could start. And of course, my, as, as you well know, if you looked at anything I, I want to say, I'm, I'm not at all worried about simplicity leading to complexity. I'm not worried about the evolution of the eye or something which seems to me a highly complex sort of thing. I think we pretty much tracked that one. But I agree with you. I don't think the origin of life problem has been solved. But my personal intuition is it's not a problem like the body-mind problem, which will never be solved. But Steve and I will go to our graves differing on this. I'm fully aware of that. Hi. Yeah. <coughs> I, I'd like you to say a little bit more about um, <coughs> the fact that this is a social agenda rather than religious. Um, because what, what I also worry about is that this social agenda also involves an economic agenda. And it's been co-opted by uh, people who are attempting to use these kinds of arguments to undermine, in, p in the public's mind, you know, the, the use of science. And so yeah. we're seeing this not only with evolution, but now, for example, wi with you know whether um, scientists have anything to say about human-induced climate change. And well, we I was just the about to say, of course, yeah. funnily enough, I mean, this is the issue. As soon as I get everything else finished, I want to get to global warming because it, you're quite right. I think that these are issues. I mean. You know, as, as I hardly have to tell somebody like you that these are very much rapidly evolving issues. And when I started on this 30 years ago, I don't think, I mean, we didn't have the new atheists, for instance. So things are moving very quickly, and economic issues, I think, are being evolved. My personal feeling was that the young earth creationists, people used to say, oh, well, they're in it for the money. They got, they're hoping to sell these textbooks. I don't think that was true. I mean, I knew Henry Morris quite well. I knew Dwayne Gish. I know Dwayne Gish very well. And I, I would talk to him a lot. And I think we talked very candidly about a lot of things. And he said, Mike, anybody who thinks I'm making money out of this has to be stark raving bonkers. He said, I was a good biochemist. I had papers. He did, published in PNAS. I mean, he really, truly did. He said, 
I could have had a terrific job either in universities or in industry. He said, with my abilities, I could have been a great dean. And he could have been. But he said, I gave it up. And we put money into starting these things. So I don't think economics was big then. Whether it could be now. And let's put it this way. Worst case scenario, Romney wins. He puts a couple more people on the Supreme Court. And they say something along the lines of, well, intelligent design theory can be taught. As think of the textbooks. which Think of folks like you and NSF, which are, th which are then going to be ordered by Congress to give money to, you know, intelligent design. So uh, is this economic? Is this social? I mean, you know, you tell me. I mean, I'm, I'm not up on that. But I do think that these are very, very important social issues. But I think that what we've got to do, and this is immodest, is I think we've got to stop pretending that these are science theology issues and recognize how fully, and I'm not the only one saying this, of course I'm not. People like Eugenie Scott have said this for donkey's years. I'm not the only one saying this, but I am one who's right in there. And of course, because I don't mind being criticized, I mean, let's face up to it, folks, it's very lonely being, you know, dumped on by Richard Dawkins and Dan Dennett as much, I mean, and Je the things Jerry Coyne, if you want to see somebody being run down, go to Jerry Coyne's blog and type in Roos and see what he says about me. You know, uh, or that nasty little piece of work from Minnesota. You know, clueless gobshite, I think, was the kindest thing they said about me, you know. But fortunately, I'm a politician. As long as, as, long as you spell my name right and pronounce it right, I got, and it's, I got no problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, uh, you know, it, it, and not, uh, I know a lot of people who just don't want to do that sort of thing. Because, you know, I, I like Dan Dennett. In fact, I had supper with him the other night, and we were very friendly. I mean, uh, you know, and then Dan Dennett gets up and says, you know, this is the worst philosophical mistake since, you know, since Julian Huxley or something like that. And it, it is a bit lonely sometimes, but what the hell, you know? My father used to say, if everybody doesn't hate you, you're not saying the right thing. <laughs> Uh, Michael, uh, I, I love your argument. I uh, wonder if I could get you to think about uh, the other part of the case, and we can talk about it in terms of the Pennsylvania Dover case. So later on, after the whole case, the good Christians of Dover voted out this radical uh, school board, basically saying publicly <laughs> with their vote, of course we want our kids to be Christian, but we also want them yeah. to be trained in science, right? And we want our kids to go to Princeton, and if they're taught this sort of nonsense, they're going to end up at um, Florida State. Yeah, <laughs> but even, even more generally. So, 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 you know, most people in America and in the world believe in a supernatural. Very, you know, atheism runs about 5% of the population. Most believe in, a, in evolution, accept it. So wouldn't it be interesting to push your argument further and say, why then are there so many people where this is not a cultural conflict at all? Well, and Dawkins also hates that, by the way. He hates that, that argument, too, that people are both religious and have no problems with the scientific world. Yes, well, I, I mean, as I said, I mean, almost, I, that's you know, my null hypothesis, though. And I want to say that I, 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 I agree with you. I mean, it's, I mean, let's face up to it. You look at abortion and homosexuality. You look at the you know, Pew surveys and these things, and you find that Catholics are more in favor of homosexual marriage <laughs> than, than anybody is. I mean, because it basically, as, as human beings, this is their position. I think an awful lot of them are, are pretty comfortable with evolution. So my null hypothesis is that's what I expect. But the simple fact of the matter is maybe, you know, these are the ones who get on to, I mean, let's face up to it. Somebody who says evolution is false is going to be, you know, and Jesus will damn you because of this and all sodomites should burn in hell. Is going to get a lot more news than somebody who says, well, you know, maybe not terribly comfortable with what they do. It's not my kind of thing, but, you know, it's, I mean, you know, my, uh, my nephew is clearly gay, and, you know, he's a nice guy, and when we go away, he looks after the dogs. I mean, that's the attitude I get in Tallahassee. And I, I remember going down there and saying, well, how do you deal with gays? You're all, they said, yes, well, we're all against gays, but, you know, they're such nice young men, and when my mother was sick, they were so helpful. You know, and that's the way that people in, Amer in the world tend to deal with these things. We're against evolution, but by God, you'd better work hard on this if you want to get into UF. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, that's the way it works. Join me in thanking Michael once again for an outstanding lecture. <laughs> How was that?
There's going to be a long hiatus till the next Waterbury lecture, which won't be until April when Nancy Nersessian will be here. And then in May when we have a visiting scholar from Spain, Marilar Jimenez Alexandra, biology educator, will be giving a lecture in May. As you can tell, this uh, lecture tonight has been uh, taped, and uh, rather than streaming them live as we've done in the past, we now have the production team from uh, WPSU uh, doing a, a, a knock-up job on this. And uh, they've told me that it takes 48 hours to turn it around, and it'll have uh, the, the multiple cameras, and it'll have the uh, closed captioning. And if you, uh, I'm assuming if you Google the uh, Waterbury Lecture, uh, you'll be able to get the website for that. If that doesn't work, you can find me in the directory and write to me personally. Thanks for coming out tonight. <laughs>